My name is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC ECHO. Welcome to this week's session, and I will turn it over to today's speaker. We'll start with the reservoir. So this diagram is just to remind us about how HIV establishes a reservoir and what it does in people typically infected. HIV depicted here will infect CD4 cells. That leads to a robust infection where most of the infected CD4 positive T lymphocytes are killed as a result of that infection. So over 99% die during primary and even chronic infections. But and a very small fraction of them will become latently infected. So they will turn off. They will no longer be active. They'll no longer be pumping out new virus. But they do contain a copy of the integrated provirus shown right here. And it's thought that these are mostly central memory T cells. They might be transitional memory or effector memory, but they are your T cell memory reservoir and a small fraction of them will contain HIV. But what these cells are, are they all the same or do they represent a heterogeneous group of cells is not really clear and this group sought to figure that out. So they started by taking PBMCs from HIV infected patients who were suppressed on antiretroviral therapy so some of those PBMCs would contain an HIV provirus here, shown in red. They stimulate them with PHA for a day and a half. And those cells that do have uh, full-length uh, transcripts will express envelope proteins on the surface of those cells, depicted here, those little trimers that are budding off of those cells. So then they bind these cells to broadly neutralizing antibodies and then fix those antibodies to magnetic beads and pass them through a column. The column will isolate the magnetic beads, which are attached to the broadly neutralizing antibody, which are attached to the envelope expressing cells. So you end up with a couple of populations, one that don't have any envelope on them, and a population that's enriched for cells that are expressing HIV envelope proteins. So they did that, and then they took a look to see how their experiment had worked. So over on the left-hand column are two panels up from two different patients, patient number 610 and patient number B207. The control cells that were not eluded through the magnetic column did not express a lot of envelope, which would be up in these panels here, whereas the, the cells that were isolated by the magnetic bead procedure had lots of envelope expression in both of these patients. When they look at those envelope expressing cells and compared to the control cells, the ones that did not, were not selected by the column. The ones that have envelope expression had much higher levels of HIV gag RNA in them and also had a higher levels of uh, infectious units when they cultivated them in an outgrowth assay. So confirming that these cells indeed have HIV provirus in them likely. So then they took those cells from each individual patient and they diluted them so that, well, by limiting dilution, so that in a 96 well plate, you know, many of the wells won't have any cells in them at all, and occasional wells will have single cells that then can grow up over time. So they did that for these three unique patients, 603, 605, and B2701, 207 rather. And this graph on the right-hand side, each line represents the analysis of a single well. So blue is one patient, green is another patient, red is the third patient. So some of the wells had incomplete proviral transcripts in them. So they might have had an envelope a gene that was expressed, but they didn't have full-length virus. When you see a solid darker line, that means that that well expressed a full-length provirus. <coughs> and if they're the same color, then it means that all those proviruses were identical. So in the blue patient, number 603, he had around 10 individual wells that had full-length transcripts, and when they sequenced those proviruses, they were all identical. Patient 605 had two wells that had full-length transcripts, and they were identical, and the red patient had five or six, and four of them were identical. One of those proviruses was a little different. So by this analysis, it looks like the cells that contain provirus in these individual patients have the same provirus. So they might be quite similar cells. So to prove that, they did a further analysis to look at the identity of these cells, and that was that they examined the T cell receptor on each of these cells. So first they did a control experiment where they had three healthy donors here, 
and they looked at, in this donor, they looked at 101 clones, 99 clones, 99 clones, or 90 clones, sorry, three different donors. The circle around them is clear. It means that every T cell they looked at had its own T cell receptor. So they were unique T cell receptors. And the same was treated in an ART group of three. The middle uh, one had 92 clones looked at, and a few of them were identical, but all the others were unique. So that's kind of baseline in people outside of this experiment. Then they looked at the cells that they had isolated from the three patients in this experiment. Those cells that were not selected by the magnetic bead column, for the most part, all of the clones that they looked at were unique. In this patient, a few of the clones had identical T cell receptors, but the vast majority of them had their own T cell receptor. Compare that to the clones that had full provirus pro in them, and virtually all of the T cell receptors in each of those three patients was identical in all the clones that they isolated, su suggesting that at least in the clones that they looked at in these three patients, they were not individual cells that had been infected with HIV, you know, right when the patient was first acquired their infection, but maybe represents proliferation of individual clones that accumulate over time, and they are not heterogeneous at all, but they represent that. So the true HIV reservoir contains clones of expanded cells with replication-competent HIV, and maybe it's the proliferation of these clonal populations that is one means for maintaining or even expanding the reservoir in people. So that was kind of a revelation and I think some great insight into what actually constitutes the HIV reservoir in chronically infected people. The next abstract is on HIV vaccine, and it actually starts a long time ago. I'm putting up these graphs from a Nature paper by Lewis Picker, who's a brilliant virologist and immunologist in Oregon. He had the good idea to see if cytomegalovirus could be used as a viral vector for introducing HIV genes into an animal or a person as a way to vaccinate that animal or person against HIV or SIV. So our Reese's CMV 68-1 is a Reese's CMV vaccine that contains HIV gag um, a gene in it and using that to inoculate monkeys. And they did that. The graphs that are shown here are a group of 12 monkeys that were inoculated with the Reese's CMV vaccine and another nine monkeys that were vaccinated with a different SIV vaccine, a DNA vaccine followed by an adenovirus boosting agent. And what you can see here in the CMV inoculated group, that half of the monkeys, six of them, ended up with very low plasma loads to, a, to SIV. So much better vaccine response than other traditional vaccines. When they looked in the tissues of these animals, uh, they found very little evidence for ongoing SIV DNA or RNA. So the first panel here is an SIV negative control, looking at DNA or RNA, and the different colored dots are GI or lymph node uh, tissue, peripheral lymph nodes, or other hematopoietic lymphoid cell tissues. But no matter what they looked at, these are the controls. There's very little or no DNA or RNA in those tissues. And again, the middle panel here is a group of monkeys who received the CMV HIV vaccine. And once again, the, some of them had low levels of detection in their tissues, but compare these panels to conventional controllers that either did not get a vaccine at all or were vaccinated with the DNA vaccine, much higher levels of RNA or DNA in their tissues. And then here's a progressing animal that has very high levels of DNA or RNA in their tissues. So much lower levels when they look there. The group that presented this data are disciples of Lewis Picker's lab, and they wanted to better understand the immune response that is elicited by this uh, CMV vaccine. So here are data presented from six different rhesus macaques here, and each line represents the entire amino acid sequence of the HIV gag protein. And when you see a little blue box there, it means that those small amino acid sequence served as a target for a cytotoxic T cell response. So if they're in blue or purple, those cytotoxic T cell responses were mediated or restricted by MHC class two. If they're in green, 
it means that they were mediated by MHC class E. And if they're common to all, if those sites are common to all six monkeys, then they, they called them a supertope. Some of the supertopes were blue, some of the supertopes were green. The surprise was that none of these CTL responses were restricted by MHC class one, which is what we usually think of as the system that is processing proteins for virological control. So MHC class two is the surprise, and then MHC class E is something that we don't even think about. So what's up with that? And furthermore, none of the monkeys who had a protective response to the vaccine uh, did not have an MHC class E restricted response. That was absolutely required for them to control their SIV infection. What the heck is MHC class E? What does it do? Well, it usually inhibits cell killing during normal non-pathogen antigen processing. So this diagram here shows a cellular protein that may, might be by, digested by the proteasome that then is brought to the endoplasmic reticulum and it might be processed and attached to MHC class E. That would migrate up to the cell surface and it would prevent a natural killer cell from recognizing that protein and attacking the cell. So it inhibits a cytotoxic T cell response to the cell, keeps it alive. So you don't want to be attacking cell uh, proteins. So that's the primary function of MHC class E. There have been some pathogens where it's been found that some of their proteins are processed by MHC class E for a cytotoxic T cell response, a CD8 response, but they are unusual and they are the subject of intense study right now. But for the most part, think of MHC class E as a negative regulatory mechanism. So we have these responses. So for this rhesus uh, CMV vaccine, it's protective and it works by processing antigen through class two and class E. So this group thought to look if they, to see if they could make a similar CMV vaccine with a different species of monkey and they chose synomalgous monkeys, and they engineered a CMV vaccine from the Sino CMV that contained an SIV gag gene, and they found that it wasn't so protective, and it expressed, it worked through MHC class one and class two, but not class E. So they went back and they looked at Sino CMV that had been used for this vaccine and compared it to the Reese's CMV, and they found that it did not contain a deletion that was included in the Reese's CMV vaccine. And that was a deletion of this particular gene, UL146, which stands for a unique long region of CMV46, and that encodes a viral cytokine. So then they went in and deleted that gene from the Sino CMV, and lo and behold, they got that vaccine to elicit class two and MAC uh, class E and supertopes, just like the Reese's CMV a vaccine did. So they seem to have dissected and found out what's required for this vaccine to work the way it does. And the exciting news is that now there is going to be a human CMV vaccine that will contain HIV gag or other genes, I'm not sure which, as a vector uh, for protecting people against HIV infection. And it will have the same deletions of these same regions, the UL-128 to 130 and the UL-146, and that is due to enter clinical trials a year from now. So this is really exciting news, a vaccine that looks to be highly effective in a monkey model, and we might be able to move it into human trials in the next year. The <coughs> last abstract that I want to talk about created a big buzz at the conference. This was presented by Dan Baruch out of the Harvard group, and they were looking at the effectiveness of a broadly neutralizing antibody called PGT-121 plus a latency reversing agent, which is made by Glaxo, 6290. This latency reversing agent is actually a toll-like receptor agonist, TLR7 agonist. The experiment was that they took 44 uh, monkeys infected with a particular isolate of SHIV. All on seven days after their infection, all the monkeys were put on suppressive antiretroviral therapy and they were kept on antiretroviral therapy for two years. And then they were given the antibody, the latency reversing agent, or some uh, control experiment. And then at a week at 130, 
they stopped antiretroviral treatment and looked to see what happened to the HIV reservoir in those monkeys. So this is the setup. 44 monkeys, 11 in each group, one placebo group, one got the latency reversing agent, one got the BNAB, and one got both. They all got put on antiretroviral therapy. This is an important point right after they got infection. So these were not chronically infected animals. They probably had smaller reservoirs than chronically infected animals or people because they got started on heart qu quite quickly. And that was continued throughout the duration of the experiment until they stopped at 130 weeks. The antibody levels in blood, lymph node, and colorectal tissue were undetectable at the time that they stopped antiretroviral treatment. So any effect that they might have seen from those reagents was not due to any residual antibody that was sticking around. There were little to no CTL responses in the groups that got the antibodies. So and again, any effect that was seen on the reservoir was not due to the induction of a cytotoxic T cell response that cleaned out the reservoir. Proviral DNA was significantly decreased in the treated animals compared to placebo animals. And after they stopped antiretroviral treatment, those that got the antibody treated and latency reversing agent treated animals exhibited no rebound or much lower rebound levels than the animals who had gotten placebo or only one of the uh, reagents. And notably, five of the 11 monkeys who were treated with both reagents experienced no viral rebound at all when you stopped antiretroviral therapy. So here's some of that primary data. This is just looking at the levels of the antibody. This is the group of monkeys that got the antibody alone. This is the monkeys that got both. And by 130 weeks, there is no antibody around in these animals. When we look for DNA in PBMCs, again, these are the animals treated with both reagents. Couldn't find it. When you looked in lymph node, couldn't find any HIV DNA. And when you stopped antiretroviral treatment, and the monkeys that got just the placebo, they all rebounded at around day 20. If they got just the latency reversing agent, they rebounded around day 20. If they got the antibody, it pushed it back to about three months. And if they got both, it pushed it back to about four months. And importantly, half of the monkeys here, including some in the other groups, didn't rebound at all. So they did a great experiment now. They took PBMCs and lymph node tissue from those monkeys that did not rebound and they injected them into new monkeys. And that's that black bar at the bottom here. And none of those new naive monkeys became infected with HIV, SIV, sorry. The, the red graphs are when these monkeys were injected with tissue from monkeys who had rebounded and they were quickly infected. So the group that had no viral rebound had no DNA. When you adoptively transferred cells from those into new monkeys, you did not stimulate a new infection, suggesting that they were cured by the PGT-121 and the latency reversing agent. So that's the conclusion. Treatment of ART-suppressed SHIV-infected rhesus macaques, decreased HIV DNA levels in blood and lymph node, no viral rebound compared with control animals, and their reservoirs, at least half of them, may have been deleted as judged by these adoptive transfer experiments. And the effect of these antibodies was not due to residual antibody and was not due to the induction of a cytotoxic T cell response. So lots of excitement about this may be a way to attack the reservoir in people as well. So I'll stop there and, and uh, take questions.